In the 1990s, the disguised serial bank robber terrorizes the Chicago area. Expert with weapons, aware of police procedure, and fearless, he hits hard and disappears fast. Police and the FBI realize the only way to stop him is to catch him in the act. But his desperate violence proves impossible to predict. The average bank robbery yields roughly $3,000. Yet some criminals risk everything for the take. In suburban Chicago, a disguised gunman began a series of robberies, growing more violent with each one. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Tracking the robber's movements, agents discovered he wasn't alone and would do anything to avoid capture. March 5th, 1990, Chicago, Illinois. $1,000? At a bank on the city's south side, employees began what they thought was a normal work day. The neighborhood was quiet until 10 a.m. Touch that alarm. The disguised gunman threatened to kill anyone who didn't follow his orders. The tellers knew not to interfere. It was over in seconds. When they were safe, they called police. Chicago police patrol officers closest to the bank responded first. The witnesses reported that the robber was a white male, about six feet tall. But they didn't see details of his features because of his disguise. He wore gloves and carried a police scanner. The man was aggressive, handling his semi-automatic handgun with confidence. He left no fingerprints, and security cameras revealed no other immediate clues. Police canvassed the area, hoping to find other witnesses. A woman who lived near the bank reported that she thought she had seen the robber. She said that at about the time of the robbery, she saw a man who seemed to be wearing a fake beard get into a small four-door sedan. She did not get the plates, but she did give officers a description of the car. Checking every similar car in the area, they soon found one they believed was the robber's getaway vehicle abandoned a few blocks from the bank. The officer approached with caution in case someone was still inside. But it was empty, except for a paper towel covering the broken ignition. A records check revealed the car had been stolen from a mall parking lot four days earlier. Later processing produced no leads to the robber. Bank robbery is a federal offense, so police contacted the Chicago FBI. Hi, this is Keith. Supervisory senior resident agent Bill Keefe had handled dozens of bank robbery calls. 
At that time, we were extremely busy with bank robberies. We had had two on one day. We were running sometimes as many as three robberies a week. Most were committed by amateurs who went in without a plan and were caught quickly. But when the bank robbery squad reviewed the reports on the south side robbery, they noted how clean the assault was, obviously well planned. They believed it was not the bearded assailant's first robbery and would not be his last. Two months later, the robber with the fake beard hit a bank in the suburb of Libertyville. Not satisfied with cash drawers this time, he ordered a teller to open the vault. Don't you try anything. Come on, let's go. He said his police scanner would let him know if anyone hit the silent alarm. Put it in there. The robber escaped with thousands of dollars in cash. But this time, a teller got the license plate number from his getaway car. While Libertyville police looked for the car, Chicago FBI agents interviewed the tellers. Special Agent Hank Schmidt learned the gunman was more aggressive this time. He controlled people with the weapon. Uh, he would intimidate them by putting the gun up towards their face. He pointed the gun directly at someone when he talked to them, uh, which was intimidating to the, the tellers and the customers. Although interviews yielded no clues, police did find the getaway car, abandoned a few blocks from the bank. Again, the vehicle had been stolen from a mall three days earlier. And as before, the thief used a towel to hide the broken ignition. FBI Special Agent Dave Childry was part of the robbery squad. The squad uncovered an earlier robbery in Wilmette, Illinois, believed to be committed by the same man. One surveillance camera photo provided a frightening clue. There was a very good picture of the robber taken in which he was using what we call a weaver stance. This is a shooting position taught to police officers. It was taught to FBI agents. And if you have been taught to shoot like that, you recognize it. This person might have had some law enforcement training. If so, he would know how these investigations work, and he could prove very difficult to catch. The local press dubbed him the Bearded Bandit. Investigators took advantage of the coverage to ask citizens for help. They published enhanced stills from the robberies, hoping someone would recognize him despite the disguise. We put his picture on the news. He did wear a beard, a fake beard, and mustache, uh, and a ball cap. So after running those pictures, we were not getting any tips from the public. In November 1990, the elusive bandit hit a bank in Wheeling, Illinois. A teller hit the alarm before he was told not to. All available units, please respond to a 1090 at the Wheeling Bank and Trust. Two Over his scanner, the gunman heard the police responding. He didn't leave the bank, which would be the normal reaction of bank robbers. They're there to rob the bank. They're not there to get involved in a shootout with the police. He stayed in the bank while the police were responding and held the gun up to the cashier and counted down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It seemed he knew how long he had before police responded. More evidence he might be a cop. As the robberies continued, 
It looked like the bandit purposely chose targets in different jurisdictions to complicate the investigation. No bank was ever hit the second time. The robberies would be on the other end of the suburban area against Lake Michigan, and then they would be out in Schaumburg or Elk Grove Village or up north in a lake county such as Libertyville. As he struck in new suburbs, the FBI had to coordinate with a growing number of police departments. Palatine, Illinois Police Chief John Kozel, a detective sergeant at the time, learned of the case and that the bandits' getaway cars belonged to shopping mall employees stolen at the beginning of their shifts. He would steal one of the employee cars knowing that it would not be reported stolen for approximately eight hours. So he knew he had eight hours to get the vehicle to where he needed to put it before anyone would even discover it missing and it would become hot on the system. When dumping the cars, the robber did his best to interfere with the ongoing investigation, wiping them clean of fingerprints and leaving no trace of himself behind. It was very apparent that he was aware of evidence gathering techniques, of police methods. In the end, agents found nothing of evidentiary value in any of the cars. Since the cars didn't help identify the bandit, investigators followed every conceivable lead that might. They visited theatrical shops around the city, hoping a salesperson might recognize the man with the fake beard as a customer. Again, nothing. The bearded bandit committed seven armed bank robberies in the Chicago area between January 1990 and February 1991. Then the robberies stopped. We went over what we had done to that point in time, looked for things we might have missed. Maybe he'd been incarcerated somewhere. Maybe he'd moved out of state. Maybe he was dead. We just didn't know. The bandit's trail stayed cold for nine months. On November 4th, 1991, Palatine police officer Kevin Maher was working the day shift. A dispatcher in training rode along to learn procedure. I was heading southbound on Quinton Road when I saw a vehicle heading northbound. And I looked in my side view mirror and I thought what I saw was an expired tag. So I made a U-turn and I was telling my ride along that we were gonna go up and see if this vehicle had expired plates. And if it did, I would conduct a traffic stop and show him how we conduct a traffic stop and how we punch all the numbers into the computer. It was supposed to be a routine stop. The person driving the vehicle swerved over to the side of the road and jammed on the brakes. He's got a gun. Maher's first instinct was to protect his passenger. The bearded bandit was back. In November 1991, a routine Chicago area traffic stop erupted in violence a when a man shot Palatine police officer Kevin Maher. I was in a state of shock because it was broad daylight, it was 11 o'clock, and it was a quiet residential street, and it was a basic ambush. And after he fired the first round, the first round came through the windshield and struck me in the shoulder, and glass from the windshield struck me in the left ear.
units officer down. The officer fire. down call went out on the Illinois State Police emergency radio network. From more than a dozen surrounding suburbs, police and emergency personnel rushed to the scene. Marr realized one of the shots that pierced his windshield was aimed dead center and might have hit him in the head had he not moved to protect his passenger and reversed the car. While paramedics treated Marr, officers questioned him. As a police officer, he was a perfect witness. Trained in recalling details, he gave them a description of the gunman, the car's license plates, the type of gun, and the direction in which the attacker escaped. We got a male white, uh, six foot, 200 pounds, beard, hat, last scene going south from the scene. So let's spread out, start looking for the car. Which way do you want to go? Police fanned out to find the shooter. More than 100 officers joined the search. Three blocks from the location of the attack, police found the shooter's vehicle. It had been reported stolen from a mall parking lot five days earlier. Palatine Police Chief John Kozel realized the grave danger. When someone is willing to shoot a police officer um, on a routine traffic stop, we all realize that he, he's willing to shoot at anyone. His determination to escape is much greater than his concern for the safety of anyone. That would be a law enforcement officer, a citizen on the street. Uh, when you're willing to shoot a policeman, you're willing to shoot anyone. Kozel helped coordinate the search for the deadly gunman. We immediately set up a perimeter with the assistance of the state, county, and local officers in the area. We had canines on the scene. Uh, we had a chopper in the air. Uh, we notified the schools in the area to stay locked down. Evidence technicians began to process the car. The ignition was broken, the damage covered by a paper towel. They looked for fingerprints that might help them identify the perpetrator, but found none. Canine handlers brought in their dogs, which are trained to remember a scent from a specified place, then follow only that scent, ignoring others. But the trail ended not far from the vehicle. Despite the massive effort, the suspect somehow slipped away. In addition to taking it personal when one of our officers is shot, uh, we all know that a citizen is much more likely to be injured or killed, and uh, we work that much harder to uh, bring him to justice. For more resources, they called in the FBI and Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keefe. I was asked to come over to the Palatine Police Department by the Chief of Police. There had been a composite sketch drawn, and everybody was reviewing the circumstances of the shooting. For nearly two years, Keefe and his squad had been working the bearded bandit case. I had asked uh, if we could look at the car that was found, and when I looked at the ignition, this was our bank robber. 
After being treated, Officer Maher came to the station to look at surveillance photos of the bearded bandit. He said the bank robber did look like the man who shot him. We surmised that he was on his way to do a bank robbery. He knew once the officer ran the plate, the car would come back stolen. He also knew that with the guns he had in his vehicle, it's not something he could conceal if the officer walked up to the vehicle. The bearded bandit had made a huge leap in violence. This guy wasn't going to go away. We were going to have to come up with a very innovative way to either identify him and charge him, or that we were going to have to catch him in the act. Chief Kozel brought the many investigators together. After the initial search, uh, uh, we set up a uh, multi-jurisdictional task force here at our police department. We had uh, the FBI, the uh, state police, Cook County Sheriff's Police, and all the local agencies uh, from our area and those involved in the Fear of the Bank Robber series. Since their suspects seemed to know police procedure, they adjusted it. We learned we had a, a violent bank robber that was using a scanner. We were no longer giving out the location of the bank over the air. We were giving out a code number for each particular bank. In progress. Go ahead and give us code the task three. force hoped patrol officers in the area also, could uh, use the codes to respond to robbery calls without the bandit bank. realizing it. Especially you undercover agent. Confident that the bearded bandit would resume his crime spree eventually, police began doing spot checks of banks throughout the region. On November 18th, two weeks after the shooting, Elk Grove Village, Illinois police officers saw nothing suspicious at one bank on their list. But later that morning, a woman leaving a nearby business did. Two people in obvious disguises entering the bank. Two weeks after a police shooting in the Chicago area that was linked to the bearded bandit, the gunman reappeared in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, this time with an accomplice. 911, can I help you? While a witness outside the bank called police, there's something very strange going on here. The robbers struck. The bandit demanded money from the vault, his accomplice standing guard. 911 dispatch, aware of the bearded bandit, used a prearranged code to alert officers. 2130, 2132, code green. Without revealing information over the police scanner. They also alerted the FBI. Special Agent Hank Schmidt realized the new danger. The big concern is that the robber, in some cases, discharges the weapon when he's using it to gesture at the employees. So the potential for violence is always there. The numbers obviously increase if we have two people that are armed. In the bank, the manager explained they could not get into the time delay vault. The dispatcher instructed the witness outside to leave in case there was gunplay. Move it. With the money from the cash drawers, the robbers fled. Unaware the police had been called, the teller hit the alarm. Elk Grove Village officers approached with their sirens off, quietly surrounding the bank. If the robbers were still inside and heard police, they might take hostages. Officers were in even more danger, according to Palatine Chief John Kozel. For the first time, we had two bearded individuals rob a bank. That, of course, increased our sense of urgency even more. Now we had two armed gunmen to deal with uh, when law enforcement arrives at these banks. 2600, can you uh, call the bank, uh, find out? Through the dispatcher, police talked with bank employees. The manager said the robbers had left. The officers had to be sure. The robbers could be holding a gun on the manager, forcing her to lie. Okay, we're gonna need to have somebody from the bank step out. 
The dispatcher asked them to send one employee outside to talk to police. The manager gave them the description of the woman chosen to go. Twenty-six hundred. Have the official come out. Okay, I see you're coming out. Hi, are you aware there was a bank alarm here? Yes. Is there anybody hurt inside? The employee assured them the assailants were gone and no one was injured inside. All right, guys, the bank is clear. Go on inside. The officers moved in to clear the bank for certain. One of the witnesses uh, told us that. She believed that the second person, a smaller person, uh, was possibly a woman disguised as a man. After the Elk Grove Village robbery, police recovered two cars with the bandit's signature ignition covering. It was more evidence of his criminal sophistication. To cleanse himself after leaving the bank, he would drop the one off a, a block from the bank uh, that he had just gotten into that all the witnesses had seen him uh, leave the bank in, and he would uh, go a few blocks away and get into the other vehicle that he had left there previous, and then since cleanse himself from that first hot vehicle. All of the cars were similar, according to Special Agent Dave Childry. We were able to kind of key in the cars by the type, the make, the size, the non-visibility of them. They were just everyday cars. He was stealing them then letting them sit for several days before using them as getaway cars. The task force asked to be notified of similar cars stolen from area shopping malls. We were successful in getting information on cars of that type that were stolen in the northwest suburbs and in the city of Chicago. We would put that information out on a weekly basis. Agent Scott Backen from the FBI and Sergeant Steve Peterson from Chicago PD actually went to every roll call of approximately 50 to 60 law enforcement agencies and spoke to the individual officers on the need to find these cars. Those personal visits mean a lot more than just putting something out on a teletype. Somewhere in the metro area, they hoped to find a getaway car after the bandit stole it, but before he used it in a robbery. Weeks later, Officer Tom Polinski was checking an apartment building parking lot in Niles, Illinois, when he spotted a stolen car on their list. It did look like the bearded bandits' work. The agreement was if they found one of those and it did turn out to be stolen when they ran the uh, license plate that they would back off and notify us. Uh, that happened, uh, we set up a surveillance on that vehicle. FBI agents and Niles police officers and detectives watched from an empty apartment overlooking the stolen car 24 hours a day. On December 13th, we found out that the Rolling Meadows police had located another stolen car that was in all probability one of the bearded bandits' cars. Chief Kozel was sure they were right. These two particular vehicles were both stolen out of uh, large mall areas. Both were owned by employees of those malls. Um, the MO was perfect. They set up surveillance on the second car in Rolling Meadows, too. Rolling Meadows PD stepped up. They shared uh, time, detectives, intelligence, sat with our agents out there 24 hours a day. To further ensure the bandit did not slip away, the FBI wanted to install tracking devices in the vehicles. But they couldn't do so in the parking lots. Late one night, agents removed the two cars. and replace them with lookalikes for a few hours. It was a risky move. 
The thief could return at any time and spot the agents or the decoy cars. At the FBI garage, technicians installed the remote tracking devices in each vehicle. They also equipped the cars with remote kill switches that would allow agents to shut down the engines from a distance. They put the cars back and waited. Days passed. There was a nagging doubt in, in all of our minds that maybe we had been discovered that perhaps he had seen one of us or a police officer going in and out of this apartment they were using to watch the car in Niles, that he had seen somebody near the car in Rolling Meadows, and that he was just going to back off these cars and never come back. We weren't sure. We just didn't know, but we, we were committed to watching these cars until something told us otherwise. After a week, the vigil paid off. A van pulled up, and a man approached one of the cars. This was, in my mind, a do-or-die effort. This is, this is going to be our only shot. If we miss this, he's going to know we're on to him. They hoped they could peacefully end the bandit's crime spree. But no one had forgotten the last time the gunman was cornered. In 1991, as Chicago area investigators watched two stolen cars they believed were going to be used in the bearded bandit's next holdup, a man entered one of the cars. Special Agent Hank Schmidt believed it was their suspect. Uh, he matched the general physical description of the, uh, the person we were looking for as the uh, bearded robber. We have a man, we have a man. The man had been dropped off at the vehicle by someone driving a van. Many go, many where again? In a white van. Heading southbound down the alley. When he drove away, the van followed. Investigators could not identify either driver. They had to be careful. If the bearded bandit and his accomplice spotted a tail, they might start shooting. But FBI technicians had installed a tracking device in the car, allowing agents to follow at a distance. The suspect parked the stolen car near a suburban bank. Any wagon is parked, the van is behind him. Hearing the news, Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keith believed they finally found their target. When that vehicle showed up in the vicinity of a bank, our adrenaline really was pumped up, and we really knew that we were going to have it. This car was likely the first getaway car for the next day's robbery. Agents believe the two suspects would next pick up the second stolen car in Rolling Meadows. They were right. That vehicle was also equipped with a tracking device. Surveillance agents followed that car, believed to be a secondary getaway car, to a hardware store about 20 miles from the bank where the pair left it. suspects in the van, agents no longer had the benefit of a tracking device and had to stay close. They followed the van into Hanover Park, Illinois, and watched as it pulled up to a townhouse. It 
Now, Special Agent Dave Childry could identify the people inside. We had a license plate and two vague descriptions of people, a man and a woman. Normal record checks on that license plate would tell us that that van belonged to Jeffrey and Jill Erickson. The FBI and police worked through the night to learn more. We had done uh, a lot of research, calling police departments, trying to see who these people were. We were looking for a, a previous arrest record, uh, which we didn't find. During this process, we had received some information that Jeffrey Erickson had been a police officer. In 1986, Jeffrey Erickson worked as a patrol officer in a Chicago suburb. He distinguished himself as a skilled marksman but he was uninterested in the everyday requirements of the job. Traffic stops, paperwork. He was about to be fired when he resigned. Records also showed that Jeffrey Erickson opened a used bookstore in early 1991, during the time the bearded bandit was on hiatus. It appeared he and his wife, Jill, a university chemistry student, led a double life using bank robbery money to build a middle-class existence. He might not have seemed threatening on the surface, but Special Agent Schmidt knew he was. Because he's a trained individual, he knows how we're going to react. He can plan ahead for that, and uh, if he's trained with a weapon, he's going to be more professional in the way he handles that weapon, and he's going to uh, be a, a bigger threat to us. Investigators considered waiting until the Ericsons approached a bank the next day, but decided not to risk a shootout near employees and customers. We had enough that we did not have to get him in the vicinity of a bank. The safest approach would be when he came to the car, the stolen car, we would arrest him. While surveillance units watched the suspect's home, A SWAT team set up near the car in the hardware store parking lot. Police Chief John Kozel. The SWAT team set up on the, uh, the vehicles were very well aware of his background and uh, knew that he may shoot first, and they were taking that into account. By the morning, they were ready for the Ericsons to make their move. About mid-morning, the surveillance uh, units advised us that the van was, in fact, moving from the residence with uh, at least two people. They were heading in the direction of where we were watching the, uh, the stolen car. The surveillance team advised us that Mr. Erickson had got out of the vehicle in an adjoining parking lot. Yeah, the driver's in the van still. He's, he's walking uh, west. The FBI had installed a kill switch in the stolen car, which they could use to turn off the engine from a distance. Uh, we watched him uh, come around the corner from that other parking lot, go to the vehicle, and enter the vehicle and start that vehicle. Erickson was distracted by the car trouble. Okay, let's go in. The SWAT team moved in. Back out of the car! Out of the car! Put your hands where I can see them. Get back out of that bag! Out of the car, put your hands where I can see them. I know that pressure uh, of to shoot car. or not shoot is a split-second decision. Get your hands up. Back, back in there, get out of the car. And most law enforcement officers don't want to have to shoot an individual if they don't have to. No one wants to take a life that way. Uh, we felt like we controlled him. Out of the car! Slowly! After twice reaching for his bag, Erickson finally followed orders. On the ground, 
If he'd come out of the bag with a gun, it would have been an entirely different situation. I asked him as we were transporting him after the arrest to the federal lockup, you being a former police officer, you would know that a gesture like that could get you shot. And he looked at me and he said, well, I figured you'd shoot me in the head and it would be over with quickly. In the car, agents searched Erickson's bag and found the bearded bandit's tools, loaded guns, a police scanner, gloves, a beard and a wig. His bank robbery kit in that bag, it was very helpful to the case. Uh, without that information or that evidence, we just arrested a car thief. Having Jeffrey Erickson safely in custody was only half the job. In the adjoining parking lot, the SWAT team approached the van. It might be Jill Erickson inside. Agents scrambled to follow. The chase barreled through 11 suburban jurisdictions, reaching speeds of 110 miles per hour. A roadblock didn't work. She had fired multiple rounds uh, out of that van, uh, either at the pursuing agents or other people in traffic. Uh, it was a big concern for the agents that she might hit an innocent civilian. Agents shot out the rear tires of the van. But the driver was not giving up. In 1991, a suspected bank robber led police and FBI agents on a dangerous chase through the Chicago suburbs. The fleeing van turned into an area that investigators knew had no outlet. They blocked the road. As the van charged them, they had to fire. They saw movement inside. Then, an FBI agent cautiously approached. The driver was wounded, a single self-inflicted gunshot. It was Jill Erickson. Later that night, in the hospital, she died. Special Agent Hank Schmidt. We believed it may have been a, a pact that they had both come up with that they would not be arrested. Uh, she that day carried out her part of the pack, and that day he decided, uh, for whatever reason, he didn't. Inside the van were spent cartridge casings, blood, fibers, other ammunition, uh, other weapons. There was a rifle with several hundred rounds of ammunition. That whole neighborhood became an, an evidentiary nightmare. There were bullets uh, that Jill had fired, uh, stuck in the side of houses, in cars, on the street. The FBI obtained a federal search warrant for the Erickson's home. Here's. 
We found some loose cash, but what impressed me was the amount of firepower in the house. An arrest at that home would have, would have evolved into a shootout. In that home, there was a weapon everywhere that you would find a picture or a statue or a knickknack in any other home. Among the weapons found was the 223 caliber semi-automatic assault rifle used in the attack on Officer Kevin Maher. Chief John Kozel realized a shootout would have been deadly to both sides. The weapons in his home were as good as any law enforcement has as far as firepower goes. Most of the long guns he had, those, that type of ammunition would zip right through an officer's bulletproof vest. Another discovery in the house spoke to the couple's mindset. One of the things that we found quite uh, ironic was the television was on and the VCR was on, and there was a Bonnie and Clyde tape in the VCR, and it was queued up to the uh, point where the uh, Bonnie and Clyde are being shot to death in the movie, and it was obvious that that was something they watched before they went out and did their bank robberies. The one robber was dead and one in custody. The violence was not yet over. Jeffrey Erickson's trial began on July 13, 1992. The evidence compiled against him was strong. In all conversations with the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, the trial was going very well. They were very uh, uh, upbeat about it, and the uh, evidence was, uh, in their mind, uh, going to be enough to convict him. But then, after court adjourned on July 20th, 1992, two deputy U.S. Marshals loaded Erickson and several jail inmates onto an elevator. Erickson was still dressed for court. The prisoners were headed for a van that would take them to the Metropolitan Correctional Center. By the time the elevator reached the parking garage, Erickson had somehow escaped his cuffs. Erickson shot U.S. Marshal Bill Frakes in the back and head, killing him. Ambushed, Frakes had not had time to draw his weapon. As the gunman ran for the street, court security officer and former Chicago police detective Harry Belwomany confronted him. Erickson shot the police veteran in the chest. But before Bellwomany died, he got off four rounds, fatally wounding Erickson. The gunman was 40 feet from the crowded streets when he died. The thing is, all these resources were brought to bear on an individual. He was captured and was being tried in court. You, you think the case is over? But unfortunately, the only person that could stop this individual turned out to be a very brave, courageous policeman named Harry Bellomini, who, while dying, shot and killed Jeff Erickson. A newlywed, Bill Frakes was a promising young lawman just nine months into his career. Harry Bellomini was a 31-year veteran. Two of his children are also Chicago police officers carrying on his legacy. The day began like any other for Cheryl and Cole Chapman until the silence of a peaceful Sunday morning was shattered with a phone call. Cheryl's sister Nancy had not shown up for work and several attempts to reach her by phone were unsuccessful. The Chapmans, sensing something must be wrong, Nancy? rushed to her apartment.
Some killers are stealthy, killing with an almost clinical precision. Others act on a violent impulse, saturating the crime scene with their rage. How a murderer behaves tells much about who he is. In 1987, the brutality of a triple homicide in Anchorage tested the mettle of even the most seasoned investigators. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. When Nancy Newman and her two young daughters were found slain in their apartment, local law enforcement needed help. They called the FBI. At the crime scene, clues were everywhere, but seemed to lead nowhere. Agents knew that to crack this case, they need to somehow get inside the killer's mind. Alaska sits on the edge of the wilderness, seemingly isolated from the rest of the world and its troubles. Its inhabitants are united by the beauty of the landscape and a mutual respect for the self-reliant nature of the community. It was shortly before 8 a.m. on a Sunday, March 15, 1987. Cheryl and Paul Chapman were awakened by a phone call. No. Cheryl's sister, Nancy Newman, was hours late for the breakfast shift at the restaurant where she worked. Nancy's shift manager told Cheryl that Nancy's car was in the restaurant parking lot, but Nancy was nowhere in sight. Maybe the Chapman should check on her. From the moment Paul and Cheryl arrived at Nancy's apartment, they sensed something was wrong. There was no sign of Nancy. Her two daughters, eight-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Angie, were nowhere in sight. Coffee mugs from Cheryl's Friday night visit with her sister were still in the sink. The remains of breakfast had been left on the table. The tin where Nancy kept her tip money sat empty. And a brown cigarette butt, not a brand Nancy smoked, was in the ashtray. Nancy? Nancy? In Nancy's bedroom, Paul made a gruesome discovery. He found Nancy lying beaten and lifeless on her bed. Paul rushed to the other bedrooms to find Nancy's two girls. To his horror, he found Melissa and Angie brutally murdered. Within minutes, the first Anchorage police officers arrived at the Newman's apartment. Not wanting to disturb the crime scene, the officers secured the area and tried to calm the distraught family until the crime scene processing unit arrived. found was horrific. 
Nancy and Melissa Newman appeared to have been beaten and strangled. Little Angie Newman's throat was cut so deeply she was almost decapitated. Anchorage police officer Bill Gifford was at the scene. Well, the impact of a case like this is uh, well, quite often it's hard to capture in words. We're pretty used to working uh, homicide cases and serious assault cases. And overall, I think a community becomes, uh, oh, if not callous, somewhat accustomed to these kind of things happening, just the uh, a typical murder. Something of this magnitude, however, people are never prepared for. The murders were so gruesome that even experienced police officers were shaken. It uh, is shocking for the for the public, and it takes a toll on its uh, on the investigators and the officers working the case as well, because you're uh, just not used to seeing, uh, as I mentioned, things of this magnitude. Nancy Newman's body was lying on her bed, her nightgown hiked up around her chest. There were abrasions on her nose, chin, and forehead, and a knee seemed to be injured. Blood stains were at the foot of the bed. A pair of olive green gloves were on top of the dresser. Good idea with color. Yeah, do a scrape so you didn't get some. Down the hall, Melissa Newman was found on her back in the middle of her room. A bloody, twisted pillowcase under her neck. Another pillowcase had been used to tie her arms. Three-year-old Angie Newman lay on her bedroom floor in a pool of blood, surrounded by her favorite books. Couple shots, a couple shots of the face. There's the bed where all the blood is. Everybody's ready? Bloodstain pattern analysis often yields clues. The positions of the victims and killer the movements of the victims, and the number of blows struck can be reconstructed by an experienced examiner. In this particular case, it assisted us in uh, establishing a sequence of events. Stains found on Nancy Newman's bed suggested that she and Melissa had been forced down the hall to her mother's room, where they were assaulted and stains on the hallway carpeting indicated that Melissa was then returned to her room and killed there. Officers treated each area as a completely separate crime scene. First, they determined the type of physical evidence that was likely to be found, and then the order it should be processed. How are we doing? Given the horrific nature of this crime and the lack of an obvious suspect, investigators knew that every possible piece of physical evidence was potentially invaluable. Detective Sergeant Michael Grimes was in charge of the Anchorage Police Department's Homicide, Assault and Robbery Unit. I knew that they were going to be in this crime scene for hours and hours and hours. Uh, this immediately is what we, we identify as a forensic case. There was very little disturbed uh, by them when they found the body, so we were very fortunate in that respect. Investigators frequently find evidence in common household dirt. Sometimes hair and fibers buried in carpeting can be traced to a suspect. For thorough coverage, investigators broke each room into quadrants and vacuumed each section. To begin the painstaking task, investigators must first cordon off a three foot by four foot area of the room. The investigator uses an ordinary vacuum with a special filter attachment. As the debris is pulled off the floor, it travels down a short tube and then goes into a collection point. 
There it becomes trapped in clean filter paper. Once a quadrant of the room has been processed, the filter is removed and placed into an evidence container. Many minute hairs and fibers are missed by crime scene vacuumings. Therefore, a portable argon laser is used, which causes unseen hairs and fibers to fluoresce when exposed to the laser's light. A technique called luminol processing was also used to look for traces of blood. If present, the luminol spray will cause the proteins in the blood to fluoresce, making them visible to examiners. We were processing the, the scene and looking for invisible traces or invisible blood patterns. And we found a luminescent impression that we were able to photograph. We also knew we had a, a knife missing out of the kitchen. We took one of those knives out of the knife set and we found that matched uh, in width and length to the uh, to that of the uh, of the luminol impression that we had. The crime scene appearance suggested the murderer had taken the victims by surprise. It appeared that Newman's morning routine was suddenly interrupted, perhaps indicating that they knew the killer. Okay, excellent. Good job. A big question was motive. At the scene, Cheryl told police that Nancy seemed to have no enemies. As a waitress, she was popular among her customers and colleagues, friendly without being flirtatious. And what possible motive could explain the rage inflicted upon eight-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Angie? Burglary was unlikely. It was obvious to investigators that the apartment had not been ransacked or otherwise disturbed. Investigators struggled to find a solid lead. Uh, Detective Bill Reeder worked the case from the beginning. The initial lead uh, came from the scene itself that we could find no signs of forced entry. So that kind of leaned us toward looking at people that had access to the apartment or knew the, knew the victims. Immediately the questioning began. Neighbors, family and friends, anyone who may have had information. What we were looking at was to find someone that had seen anything unusual uh, any strangers in the area had heard anything unusual, had seen someone carrying things away, uh, anything at all that would help us uh, focus on, on someone or somebody. Family members are almost always suspects early in an investigation. Paul Chapman was no exception. Though he had no one to back up his alibi, which was that he was alone most of Saturday. His reaction to discovering the bodies was clearly one of Trump and us. Investigators spoke with everyone close to the family and learned that Nancy Newman was happily married to John Newman, the father of their two girls. He was a suspect, spouses usually are. But John Newman was in California training to be a locksmith at the time of the murders. Another way to eliminate a suspect is to watch and continue to talk to him. Uh, John never gave us any indication other than he wanted this case solved. Uh, he was extremely distraught, gave all the signs that anybody would give under the circumstances. Because the Newmans lived in a multi-unit apartment complex, Detective Grimes knew that interviewing neighbors in the immediate area would be a daunting task. It was an apartment in a multi-unit apartment house, which was in a particular area of town that uh, was surrounded by large multi-unit uh, apartment houses. Uh, and we were looking at 
literally hundreds of, of dwellings in that area. The close-knit community of Anchorage was shocked by the brutality of the murders. Police investigators, having no experience with crimes this shocking, were asking the most frightening of all possible questions. Was a serial killer a possibility? Police felt pressure to work quickly. For what kind of person would do this kind of crime? Uh, was there significance in the way the people were murdered uh, that could give us some kind of leads as to who we were looking for, or at least what type of person? And uh, so immediately, I'd say within the first day or so, we were getting some help from the FBI. Investigators quickly realized they needed help in determining the type of individual responsible for the murders. They turned to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit at Quantico, Virginia. Special Agent Judd Ray received the call. As a profiler in the unit, Ray's job was to assist investigators in hunting down America's worst killers. To do that, Ray had to understand the workings of a killer's mind. We were looking at deeds and acts of individuals after it happened and trying to predict the kind of personality, if you will, a composite view of what kind of human being could have done it. Through detailed evaluations of crime scene photos and police reports, Ray provided investigators with a psychological portrait of the killer. This is a disorganized uh, crime scene. I mean, you know, low self-esteem, all the kind of things that you would say about, uh, about this kind of person, you know, that uh, he's been, uh, he's, uh, <clears throat> society has rejected him through the years, and now it's his time to reject society. Ray told the Anchorage detectives that they possibly faced a repeat performance. This particular incident alarmed him so much, particularly with uh, you know, three victims at one time, two being children, uh, that his opinion also, he said that, uh, you know, we need to get something working on this right away because uh, it appears that this person's out of control and there's the potential that uh, uh, he's going to be doing it again in the very near future. From the autopsy reports, investigators learned that Nancy and eight-year-old Melissa Newman had been sexually assaulted. Based on this information and characteristics of the crime, Ray concluded that this violent offender would have a history of sexual assault. He would be a white male in his early to mid-twenties, an underachiever. Following Ray's conclusions, investigators began to narrow the range of possible suspects. Among them was a young man who had recently moved in a few doors down from the Newmans. Police also questioned Kirby Anthony, the 23-year-old nephew of John Newman. Anthony had an alibi into the morning hours of Saturday, March 14th, but the neighbor did not. There was a tremendous uh, rage that was inflicted uh, on the almost decapitated the, uh, the young three-year-old suggested that they, to me, that, 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 that there's nothing uh, in my mind that I had uh, came across that would uh, have been sufficient on its face to justify this kind of rage by a stranger. Ray's insistence that the killer was known to the victims led investigators to shift focus away from the man who lived nearby. Neighbors and friends of the Newmans confirmed the young man's claim that he had never met Nancy Newman or her children because I had talked about familiarity, somebody that's close to the family, somebody that knows her, that had some sort of relationship with her, perhaps even been rejected by her. Uh, they said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a nephew that comes to mind. As investigators continued questioning possible suspects, the volume of evidence that had been collected from the crime scene was taxing the limits of Alaska's state crime lab. Once again, Anchorage police turned to the FBI. The evidence was sent to the FBI's crime lab in Washington, D.C.
hair and fiber expert Doug Dietrich was given the case. Dietrich began by sorting through the evidence, searching for any link to a suspect. Hairs, fibers, glass particles, soil, paint chips, anything that may have been transferred during the killer's violent contact with his victims. Altogether, I believe I looked at three, over 300, close to 400 items of evidence from the crime scene, from the victims, from elimination samples from different people, both suspect and relatives and possible acquaintances. Fibers are unusually difficult to trace. And because no one knew what the killer was wearing during the murders, there was no basis in which to compare recovered fibers. The varieties that are out there uh, are endless. So that when an individual in a case, for instance, who is wearing a particular type of clothing, uh, transfers fiber material, that evidence will, will be considered to be unique. Even though they may have made a number of garments of the same type, by the time it gets out into the public, this material is dispersed like a drop of oil in the ocean. It just, it's there, but it's hard to find. Distinct fibers, amounting to less than a thimble full of evidence, were recovered from throughout the Newman's apartment. Diedrich's expertise of fiber transfer, however, enabled him to reconstruct the suspect's movements during the crime giving investigators a clearer picture of what actually transpired in the apartment. As Diedrich's analysis progressed, Anchorage police asked Kirby Anthony to come to the police department to give more detailed statements. They began to learn more of his story. Henrose. Anthony and his girlfriend had moved from Twin Falls, Idaho to Anchorage 18 months earlier. Both had stayed at the Newman's for a while, but were asked to leave about the time they found jobs on a fishing boat. He and his girlfriend split up while working on the boat after Kirby accused her of having an affair with the skipper. His mates described him as irrational and unstable after the breakup. He clashed with the skipper and was fired. He returned to Anchorage alone on February 14th, 1987. Having nowhere else to go, Anthony took a taxi from the airport straight to the Newlands. Through Cheryl Chapman's continued assistance, Police learned that John Newman was upset over his nephew's return to the Newman household during his absence. At the same time, the situation was becoming increasingly uncomfortable for Nancy. After a few weeks, she asked Anthony to leave. He moved in with an acquaintance, Dan Grant. As the investigation began to focus on Kirby Anthony, Sergeant Grimes recalled his first encounter with him. The day of the murders, Detective Grimes took on the task of notifying Anthony about the deaths. I told him that uh, we had some bad news for him, that uh, his aunt and, uh, and her two little girls had been found dead just earlier that morning. Uh, as I recall, Curly, Kirby uh, grabbed his hair and and started wailing and, and moaning, uh, but it was all dry-eyed, there was no tears. Anthony's demeanor did not fit that of a grieving family member, but Grimes knew that Anthony's odd behavior would never justify an arrest. The autopsy report, however, made investigators more suspicious. Autopsy results helped pinpoint the murders between 7 a.m. and noon on Saturday, March 14th. 
what we're able to, to demonstrate is that the murders happened early in the morning after the victims had, had uh, gotten up in the morning. The, uh, one of the victims had had a bowl of cereal. The other was in the process of eating some cereal. The mother was in the process of having a cup of coffee. Establishing the time of the deaths made Anthony's alibi irrelevant, which was that he was at an all-night party until early that Saturday morning. He admitted that he drank, smoked some marijuana, and did cocaine. Hey, man, wake up. Get up, man. He said he returned to the house he shared with Dan Grant at about 7 a.m., then left again at about 8.45 a.m. Meanwhile, FBI agent Diedrich's investigation into fiber and hair evidence was growing more complicated. Uh, one of the items that had come in uh, it consisted of vacuum sweepings. At least there were several vacuum sweepings from different rooms. Those items have to be processed and hairs have to be prepared from that. What was, I think, probably the most difficult aspect of this case for me was in trying to account for every hair that was found in that residence. And that's something that's not usually done and, and uh, seen as there, there are often too many hairs to deal with. Uh, but in this case, it was, it was a monumental task to do that. Each hair displays its own peculiar characteristics under a microscope, making it possible to trace its likely origin. The fact that hairs will differ from person to person is, is very evident when you magnify these characteristics upwards of 250, 400 times. To examine the fibers and hairs collected at the scene, Diedrich used two high-powered comparison microscopes connected by an optical bridge, one for known material and the other for material yet to be identified. Because Anthony had lived with the Newmans for a while, his hair was likely to be in the apartment. That meant it was important to establish whether the trace hairs were old or recent. So Diedrich went through the contents of the vacuum used in the Newman household. Because of the vast quantities of hairs and other items that were found in the bag, uh, I had to look at the vacuum bag from a layer standpoint. That is, what was the most recently deposited or recently vacuumed material. Since Kirby Anthony had denied being in the Newman's apartment recently, it was imperative that Diedrich determine the condition of the hairs. The condition of the surface of hairs, uh, the condition of the ends, the roots uh, will often indicate how long a hair may have been in a particular environment. Working his way through the layers of the Newman's vacuum bag, Diedrich found some of the same types of hairs that did not appear to belong to any of the Newmans. These hairs had been recently deposited. In addition to the vacuum sweepings, unidentified pubic hairs were also found on the victims and inside their bedrooms. To determine the significance of these findings, Diedrich now wanted to know how hairs usually are transferred from one room to another. So he conducted his own experiment. Uh, it was a question as to how likely would it be to find somebody's hairs, say pubic hairs, in different areas of a home. So I designed a, a little experiment where I took a, a vacuum home, crime scene vacuum to my house and vacuumed four bedrooms over a two-week period, same time every day, just to see what types of hairs might be found. I was focusing mainly on pubic hairs. Diedrich preserved the material from every sweeping. He then compared the hairs from those sweepings with known hairs from himself. Diedrich was able to conclude that the hairs did migrate from room to room, mostly by sticking to socks or other clothing. The hairs deposited at the beginning of the experiment were deeper in the vacuum debris and therefore more damaged. The more recently deposited ones were not. 
The finding was significant to Diedrich. Since Cheryl told police that Nancy vacuumed her house Friday, the unidentified hairs found on the victims would have been deposited right at the time of the murders. Under microscopic scrutiny, an important piece of evidence was revealed. A pubic hair with a partial egg casing, the kind associated with genital lice, was clinging to the damp washcloth found in the Newman's bathroom. Diedrich told investigators of his findings and waited for a sample from a suspect in order to make a comparison. There were at least a half a dozen individuals who were considered prime suspects. Investigators received lists from the State Corrections Department of people recently released who had a history of sex crimes or violence. Some of them were living in the area close to the Newmans. To eliminate these individuals as suspects, each one was extensively questioned and all of their alibis were checked out. Police continued to question Anthony. He admitted nothing. But with each interview, the details of where he was and what he did the morning of the murders changed slightly. That was a, uh, kind of a, uh, an indicator of what we were going to be dealing with with Kirby from the get-go, was these little lies that weren't necessary but were thrown out to us. Unaware of Diedrich's hair analysis, Anthony was asked by investigators to submit hair and blood samples. Wanting to appear cooperative, he voluntarily submitted the samples. They were rushed to Diedrich for comparison. The next day, Diedrich notified investigators that Anthony had pubic lice. Well, that was probably the most significant breakthrough. Uh, at that point, we could start focusing on Kirby as the suspect. When confronted with the evidence of the hair and egg casing on the washcloth, Anthony admitted that he did have lice. He said he had showered at the Newmans a week before the murders so as not to spread the pubic lice at Dan Grant's house. For Judd Ray, the dirty washcloth left at the crime scene told much about the suspect. The killer had cleaned himself at the murder scene. Why take the risk? Why not go home? It was obvious to me that he had to that he had to go somewhere where he, where where he couldn't go there all bloody, uh, 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 which sort of got into this guy's not a loner living living alone somewhere. Ray's behavioral profile also predicted the killer would have been associated with a previous sexual assault. This prediction prompted investigators to look deeper into Kirby's past. They learned that Kirby Anthony had been the central suspect in an Idaho case that remains open to this day. The victim, a 12-year-old girl, suffered brain damage in the attack and was unable to testify. He had... Uh just previous to coming to Alaska, uh, been the focus of police attention down there. They had a uh, some type of uh, outdoor picnic outing, and uh, there was a 12-year-old that was found in the woods. She had been strangled, unconscious, uh, near death, uh, and she had been sexually assaulted. Uh, their investigation uh, pointed right at Kirby Anthony. Ray also predicted the killer would want to appear cooperative with police. They told us that the suspect would, would interject himself into the investigation. Uh, he would call to find out what the evidence was showing, and Kirby started doing that. What investigators did not share with Anthony was that Diedrich's other hair comparisons were also pointing to Anthony. The pubic hair found on the washcloth was only one of many positive associations Diedrich was able to make between hairs found at the crime scene and those submitted by Anthony. And in this case, uh, a number of pubic hairs that were like Kirby Anthony's were found in, in the rooms, both uh, the victim's rooms, the two girls, and as well as a couple of them that were similar to his on the bed of the mother. 
A hair from Anthony's head also was found on the top sheet of Nancy Newman's bed. Facial hairs that matched Anthony's beard were found on all of the victims and in their rooms. The vacuum sweepings from Melissa's room contained nine of Anthony's pubic hairs. The sweepings from Angie's room included two pubic hairs, one with blood and one with lice casings. Investigators felt it was time to keep tabs on Anthony's movements. Through surveillance, investigators learned of Anthony's hangouts and discreetly followed him around town. They hoped that Anthony would reveal something to his friends that would further implicate him in the murders. If he did, the investigators would soon find out. The effort paid off. One of Anthony's acquaintances told investigators that he was writing poetry on napkins and passing the poems around the table. He told one of the women that Nancy Newman had been forced to watch part of the assault. Investigators also learned that at one point after the murders, Anthony called his ex-girlfriend's mother in Idaho to tell her about the crime. Angie Newman had been stabbed, he said, and Nancy and Melissa sexually assaulted. In both instances, the call to Idaho and the scene at the bar, Anthony could not yet have known about the details he described. The information had not been released by police to the press, nor had investigators mentioned it to Anthony during questioning. Since the surveillance was not a 24-hour-a-day tactic, they would often drive by his house to see if his vehicle was parked out front. If he was home, investigators would often ask him to answer some questions. The circumstantial evidence against Anthony was mounting. During a visit to his residence, investigators noticed a manually operated camera belonging to John Newman that had been reported missing after the murders. He told detectives that the Newmans lent it to him, but when asked later to demonstrate how it worked, he seemed to have no idea how to operate it. Another item missing from the Newman house seemed to be traceable to Anthony. The tip money missing from the cookie tin consisted only of coins. Three of Anthony's friends told police they either saw him rolling coins into wrappers or saw him pay for items with wrapped coins. And then there were the prints. Anthony's palm print was found on the wall over the bed where Melissa Newman had been assaulted. Prints found on the empty cookie tin on the kitchen table matched Anthony's. His prints were also found on the living room closet door and the inside and outside of the apartment door. Another place we located one of uh, Kirby's fingerprints was on the back side of the door to the mother's bedroom. And again, its, its position was significant in that it uh, led us to believe that perhaps uh, someone was trying to escape out of the room and he already had some other trace evidence on his hand, he slammed the door shut, uh, transferring not only his fingerprint but some of the other trace evidence that was found in the scene. The evidence was overwhelming. Every suspect in the month-long investigation had ultimately been cleared, except Kirby Anthony. Appreciate that. What, well, when you got home, was there anyone there? For investigators, it was time to obtain an arrest warrant. And when you got home, Judd Ray had previously cautioned investigators that the killer might try to flee if the pressure became too much. The increasing intensity of police questioning had made Anthony nervous. Judd Ray was right again. Anthony confided to his roommate, Dan Grant, that he was leaving town. He asked his friend not to tell police. Grant 
Grant was afraid to contact Anchorage police because of Anthony's notorious temper. Second precinct test. Nonetheless, he did finally call them seven hours later. Okay. Anthony was heading to the Canadian border, an eight-hour drive away, and he had a seven-hour head start. Anchorage and the Canadian border are separated by hundreds of miles of uninhabited wilderness. Anthony could be hiding anywhere. Anchorage police quickly contacted U.S. Customs at the Alaska-Canada border. They described Anthony in his vehicle and told the custom official that Anthony was a suspect in a triple homicide. They were hoping he was on his way. Less than an hour later, Anthony arrived at U.S. Customs. Having no idea that investigators had been tipped off, Anthony calmly pulled up to the Customs gate. Step out of the car. Could you get out of the car, please? He was detained and questioned until Alaska State Troopers arrived. He was arrested for driving on a suspended license and returned to Anchorage. Thanks a lot for the hospitality there. As he was turned over to the Anchorage police, he was read his rights and charged. Three counts first degree murder, two counts sexual assault, and one count kidnapping. Under Alaska law, kidnapping can be charged if a victim is restrained during an assault. Melissa Newman had been tied up during the attack. He jumps up and screaming, what is this kidnapping stuff? Uh, which struck us as odd because uh, here he was charged with three counts of murder and, and two counts of uh, sexual assault. And, uh, and he's screaming about the kidnapping charge. By this time, the forensic evidence was complete enough that police believed they could reconstruct how Angie, Melissa, and Nancy were brutally murdered. The last time Cheryl Chapman saw her sister alive was Friday, March 13th. Cheryl, Paul, and Nancy had each arrived separately at the restaurant where Nancy worked to meet for drinks. Cheryl's daughter, Kelly, had taken Nancy's girls swimming, so the adults had a night out. Paul Chapman had to leave the restaurant early to pick up his son, but planned to meet them later at Nancy's apartment. As they were leaving, Cheryl suggested that Nancy leave her car at the restaurant and ride home with her. Nancy had Saturday off, and Paul would gladly give her a ride back to her car tomorrow. I don't know. I never paid attention. So you're in, what, 11.30? Yeah. What time are you coming? Uh, 11. 11. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Cheryl, Paul, and Nancy all ended up at the Newman's apartment to wait for Kelly and the girls. They sat, laughing and talking, until about 9.45 when the girls came home. Kelly had treated them to hamburgers. At about 10 p.m., Cheryl and Paul were ready to leave. Cheryl helped Nancy clear the table and put the used coffee mugs in the sink. Angie was already in her pajamas, and Melissa had gone to her room to get ready for bed. As they said goodnight, Paul told Nancy to call him the next day if she wanted a ride back to her car. Sometime between 7 a.m. and noon on Saturday, March 14th, Kirby Anthony arrived at the Newman's apartment. Kirby Anthony is the only person who knows what happened next. Perhaps Nancy refused to lend him money. Perhaps she refused a sexual advance. Perhaps she ordered him out of the apartment.
In any case, his anger boiled over. Evidence indicated that part of the assault on Melissa occurred in her mother's room. Both would have had to have been restrained, and their bodies did show signs of having been bound. We are able to show through serological findings that Melissa, the eight-year-old, had been assaulted in the mother's bedroom and that she had crossed the bed and was actively bleeding at the time. And then uh, she is subdued somehow and held in a position in that room for a period of time. Melissa Newman probably witnessed the rape and murder of her mother. She then was taken back to her bedroom where she was assaulted again and killed. It was unclear whether she was killed first or last. What was certain was that she seemed to be the target of a horrible, uncontrolled rage. Nancy Newman did not call Paul Chapman the next day for a ride to her car, nor did she answer the phone when her sister tried to reach her repeatedly. Instead, she and her two daughters lay dead nearly a full day before their bodies were discovered. The particular grudge against Angie may have grown out of the few times that Anthony babysat the girls. Reportedly, he had called her a tyrant. But for those close to the victims, and for investigators working the case, nothing could explain Kirby Anthony's savagery. I don't really think that, that, that you could isolate any one thing that would cause a man to fly into the homicidal rage like Kirby Anthony did. Yeah, for the most part, uh, you know, I don't think that Kirby Anthony could even tell you why he would do something like that. A grieving John Newman sat in stony silence throughout his nephew's trial. After eight weeks of testimony, the jury reached a verdict on June 3, 1988. A clean-shaven Anthony seemed confident as he waited for the verdict. As each guilty verdict was read, Anthony's composure disintegrated until finally it shattered completely. He was sentenced to 357 years for his crimes. Kirby Anthony's conviction represented an almost textbook example of cooperative police work. Anchorage police provided the FBI with evidence collected from a meticulously preserved crime scene. Doug Diedrich carefully analyzed the hairs and fibers and anticipated Kirby Anthony's excuses, conducting his own home experiment to refute them. Judd Ray helped police stay several steps ahead of Anthony's thoughts and actions. And for the first time, 
testimony of an FBI profiler was accepted in court. It was a good case to test the waters in terms of uh, whether or not this was going to be accepted in, in our judicial system. And for that, the implications are probably uh, far-reaching uh, because it opened the door. On the streets of Washington, D.C., a bomb blast kills a former ambassador and his young assistant. As the FBI investigation closes in on the bombers, the killers set their sights on the agents and their families. The FBI is caught up in a dangerous hunt for a cold-blooded murderer as they target one of the most highly skilled opponents they have ever faced, a bomber who orchestrates the death of a diplomat. In the 1970s, South America faced a surge of political kidnappings and assassinations. When the killing spilled onto U.S. soil, it was time for the FBI to step in. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents struggled to pierce the closely guarded world of diplomats and assassins, trained spies and hired thugs, determined to stop a covert terror war waged by a rogue nation. Washington, D.C., September 18th, 1976. A man prepares deadly revenge against one of his nation's fiercest critics. Dear friends of Chile. The intended victim is former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier. The, the outspoken socialist is in the U.S. condemning the military government of dictator Augusto Pinochet. The Pinochet government seized power three years earlier in a bloody coup. Letelier rails against the current Chilean regime for human rights violations and for stripping him of his Chilean citizenship. His outspoken criticism causes one European country to stop lending money to Chile. Just after midnight on September 19th, the bomber prepares to silence the diplomat once and for all. The radio-controlled bomb is secured under the driver's seat of Letelier's car. Now, all it needs is the right radio signal. Two days later, Letelier drives to work. His assistant, 25-year-old Ronnie Moffat, rides in the passenger seat. Her husband, Mike, rides in back. The car soon arrives on Embassy Row. Okay. Police protecting the embassies call for ambulances and rush to help. Orlando Letelier is barely alive. The bomb blew off his legs and blasted shrapnel through his torso. Ronnie Moffat, hit by flying shrapnel, fights for every breath. Mike Moffat, incredibly, escapes unhurt, although frantically worried about his wife. An ambulance rushes Letelier away just as the FBI arrives. Special Agent Carter Cornick. When we got there, like all crime scenes, it was an absolute mess. I saw the car, and there was a woman on the side of the road being administered to. The next thing I actually heard through the din of all the noise was a young man screaming, Dina did it. And I had no idea who or what Dina was. Under the law, the FBI investigates all attacks against foreign officials. Agent Cornick takes charge of the case. 
Well, the first thing that it was to do was, was to get hold, get control of the crime scene. A crime scene is a unique thing. It's only there once. And what you do at that crime scene very often determines, ultimately, the outcome of the case. Agent Cornick requests more agents, including FBI bomb experts, to collect and label every possible piece of evidence. We had an enormous amount of help. We had more than 150 agents doing the crime scene. We actually had forensic experts doing the crime scene. And that part of the crime scene was actually run by the chief of the explosive unit at my request. During the search, the FBI hears the tragic news from the hospital that Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffitt have died. The case is now a murder investigation. At the U.S. District Courthouse, the U.S. attorney decides this politically sensitive public assassination must be handled with the utmost care and urgency. In this case, a U.S. attorney was assigned to the investigation from day one. That had never been done before except in Watergate. The U.S. attorney assigns his most relentless prosecutor, U.S. Assistant Attorney Gene Proper. It was a heinous murder, and I wanted to solve it to make sure that people knew you couldn't do it here. I don't care if Letelier was a socialist, a communist, or, or somebody on the far right. He was killed in a brutal way on the streets of the District of Columbia with a young woman, neither of whom deserved to die. Tell me what you found out about By the second day, investigators begin looking at possible motives for killing Letelier. The primary motive from the beginning appeared to be a political assassination ordered by a foreign government. We had found out from the State Department that the military dictatorship of Chile was concerned that he had been personally responsible for stopping loans coming to the country. Buenos Aires, Argentina. FBI Special Agent Bob Shearer does not want to tip off the Chilean government, so he talks with his contacts in Buenos Aires. He wants to find out if they have any information on whether Chilean intelligence may be involved. His Argentine source tells him about a secret program called Operation Condor. Intelligence agencies from right-wing South American countries have agreed to help each other watch left-wing activists and, if necessary, eliminate them. The official believes that Letelier's death may have been Condor's first kill. To get more information, the FBI turns to a U.S. State Department expert on Chile. The expert tells them that Chile desperately needs American economic support. The same morning of the assassination, the economics minister of Chile was getting off a plane at Dulles Airport to ask the U.S. government for economic aid to Chile. Uh, the expert highly doubts that Chile would endanger its loans by killing Letelier. So it was difficult for me to believe that a government uh, would, on the one hand, order the assassination of this man, while on the other hand, trying to ask the U.S. government for aid. Two weeks after the Letelier assassination, a commercial flight from Barbados to Cuba explodes. All 73 people aboard die. After the explosion, right-wing anti-Castro Cubans proudly claim credit. Because of the timing of the bombing of the airliner, investigators wonder if anti-Castro Cubans may have also had a hand in the assassination. Letelier was a socialist and an admirer of Fidel Castro. It seems like a long shot, but right now it's the only lead the agency has. Agent Cornick asks the FBI lab to compare the Letelier bomb against past anti-Castro Cuban bombs. Technicians have little to work with because the explosion destroyed most of the evidence. 
what little remains, they determined that the bomb is unlike anything they've ever seen before. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack. The lab came back and said basically the Letelier bomb doesn't match other right-wing Cuban bombs that we have examined already. Um, we didn't want to hear that. That's the last thing you want to hear, that it, you don't have a match. But because of the right-wing Cubans' history of assassinations, investigators can't entirely rule them out. We were trying to keep an open mind that perhaps we have a, a new bomb maker on the set that we're not aware of. Having hit a dead end, investigators set up a tip line to solicit information from around the world. Thousands of leads, literally thousands of leads, came in by telephone. A special 1-800 number was established to handle the leads. We had leads coming in from Europe, leads particularly from Latin America. One lead comes from a New York area reverend who says three Chilean intelligence agents flew out of New York shortly after the assassination. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack interviews the reverend. And it was evident, you know, in the first five minutes of the interview that this guy uh, had seen nothing. So, of course, I'm trying to zero in on, look, you know, who exactly saw these three Chilean agents? The reverend got the tip from some friends, but he will not reveal their names. I told the reverend, I said, look, get back to the people that supposedly saw this and uh, get them in touch with us. While he's waiting, Agent Wack heads to New York's JFK airport. He follows up on the reverend's tip that Chilean agents flew out shortly after the assassination. These items should be noted by the... No one can confirm the story. The case stalls again. There's nothing. A few weeks later, Agent Wack says goodbye to his fiancée, who leaves for her job as an airline flight attendant. He has no idea he is not the only one who watches her go. In the airport parking lot, a threatening stranger confronts Wack's fiance. The bombers are striking back, hitting the FBI close to home. A car bomb in Washington, D.C. kills former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his assistant. As the FBI begins investigating the murder, Special Agent Larry Wack's fiance is threatened. The frightened flight attendant calls Agent Wack. I was absolutely appalled that something like this would happen, that uh, whoever it was uh, didn't have the guts to come after me, that they had to go after her. Agent Wack believes he must have interviewed someone close to the assassination. I don't know what we did, but we struck a nerve somewhere. And now we got to go back and re-examine what we've been doing, and, and, and myself, particularly what I had been doing, who I had been talking to and so on, to see where this threat may have emanated from. Agent Wack's fiancé helps create a sketch of the man who threatened her. Agents show the sketch to Chilean immigrants throughout New York, trying to find someone who recognizes the man. But no one seems to know him. Washington, D.C., one month after the bombing. Clearly said in Townsend versus New York. Assistant U.S. Yeah. Attorney Gene Proper and FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick receive a possible lead. Chilean. The State Department provides photos of two suspicious Chilean intelligence officers whose real names are unknown. A month before the Letelier killing, at the U.S. Embassy in Paraguay, two Chileans requested visas for what were obviously false passports. One of the men did not look Chilean, and the two openly admitted being intelligence agents. They claimed they needed the visas to attend a meeting with the CIA in Washington, D.C. 
Well, I'll need to see your passport. The ambassador decided to take the unusual precaution of secretly photographing the passports. Thank you. When the CIA denied knowing the two agents, the ambassador canceled the visas. What do we know about these guys? Investigators believed the photos could relate to their case. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. We had these two photographs, but we didn't know who they were. If we could identify those two people, we could take the case a step further. The bug shots, we gotta roll through the books. We gotta roll these guys. A few days later, investigators get a lead that again points them to Cuba. A Venezuelan newspaper prints a story claiming right-wing Cubans based in the United States killed Letelier. It names the prime suspects as the Ayala brothers from New Jersey. Investigators know Enrique and Sanchez Ayala well. They are founding members of a violent anti-Castro group called the Cuban Nationalist Movement. They are suspects in several recent high-profile bombings, including a Russian ship in New York five days before the Letelier assassination and an attempted bombing at the New York Academy of Music where Cuban artists were set to perform. The FBI begins to wonder if the Ayala brothers also targeted Chilean socialist Orlando Letelier. In one of New Jersey's Cuban neighborhoods, an FBI agent tracks down Enrique Ayala to find out. When the agent asks him where he was the day Letelier was killed, Ayala gives an odd reply. That's my trump card. It's an ace up my sleeve. Investigators in Washington, D.C. find his comments suspicious. Well, I think there's Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper. Right away, when you hear something like that, you begin to think, well, what's this guy want to hide? Proper asks the FBI to serve Ayala with a subpoena to appear before the grand jury. In the United States, no citizen is obligated to talk to the police or the FBI. If the FBI comes up to you on the street, you can say, get lost. There is an obligation to testify before the grand jury if you're brought in by subpoena. An agent heads out to serve Enrique Ayala with the subpoena. FBI. Ayala's wife says she doesn't know where he's gone. He's disappeared. Agents question anti-Castro Cubans, demanding that they give up Ayala. The pressure finally gets to Ayala, who agrees to come in. At Proper's office in Washington, D.C., Ayala proclaims he had nothing to do with Letelier's death. Investigators ask why he made the comment about an ace up his sleeve. Ayala says he was just joking, pulling the agent's chain. Help me. Proper grills Ayala before the grand jury. He denies any knowledge of the Letelier murder and takes the fifth when asked if he has recently traveled to Chile. New York City. A few days after Ayala's testimony, Special Agent Wack gets a call at home from a suspected anti Castro bomber. Do what? He said that uh, I'm coming over to your house in a minute to talk to you. Agent Wack fears he is in danger. The big question was, uh, how did he get my phone number? More importantly, how did he know where I lived? So I grabbed my neighbor, who was a New York City police officer, told him, grab your gun, come outside. And I told him what had happened, that I had gotten this phone call, and I don't know what's coming next. We hid outside in an alleyway, and uh, within a period of about three minutes, here comes this nationalist guy at my front door. Yeah, it's him. He recognized me. We had an altercation out in front of my residence where he was telling us, you know, that uh, they didn't have anything to do with the threat on my fiance, and, you know, why don't you back off of our group? I pretty much told him that uh, the next time you show up at my front door, uh, you're going to go home in a body bag. 
I was extremely mad at this uh, this whole situation. I mean, it was it was bad enough that my fiance gets threatened, and now I got these bombers showing up at my front, my front door, you know. And you're like, you know, what's next? Far from backing off, Agent Wack cranks up the pressure. If the Cubans are nervous, the FBI must be close to finding their connection to the assassination and possibly even the bomber. Agent Wack goes after the Cubans, hunting for anyone with information. If you think you're going to intimidate the FBI into not investigating, you're making a mistake. You're going to make them investigate harder. I don't know nothing about it. The people he approaches give him the cold shoulder or even insult him. But he continues to hunt for leads. Finally, five weeks after Letelier's murder, Agent Wack meets a former Cuban bomb maker who says he wants to talk. It could be a major break in the case. Or it could be a setup for a hit on an FBI agent who's getting too close to the truth. A powerful remote control bomb kills former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his assistant in Washington, D.C. The FBI believes the key to the case may be hiding in the New York anti-communist Cuban community, an organization known for targeting outspoken socialists. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack doggedly hunts for leads until a former anti-Castro bomb maker tells him he wants to talk. And the thing that he couldn't sleep with was he didn't care that Latelier died. Uh, he couldn't sleep with the fact that the girl was killed, Ronnie Moffat. And that's where he drew the line. The bomb maker says he's heard that Enrique Ayala, the leader of a violent anti-Castro group, has met several times with a Chilean covert contact. He said the Cubans wanted support from the right-wing Chilean government. Agent Wack uses the information to question other informants. They tell him that Ayala has been seen meeting with a tall, blonde Chilean with a military bearing. One informant was telling me that the nationalists were referring to him as El Flaco, or the, the tall, thin one. Agent Wack has now confirmed the link between a Chilean agent and the Cuban nationalist movement. Now you've got evidence of a Chilean agent in contact with a nationalist, and you've got the nationalists with a track record of bombings going back quite a few years. So, you know, it's starting to look like a duck and walk like a duck. The FBI focuses their investigation on Chile, in Santiago. FBI Special Agent Bob Shearer follows up on Agent Wack's discovery of Enrique Ayala's link with Chilean officials. Chile's Interpol representative tells him that Ayala visited Chile two years earlier and may have met with the Chilean government or even the Chilean intelligence service. With this new information, Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper subpoenas Enrique Ayala and two of his friends to appear once more before the grand jury. A few days later, Proper gets a death threat on his private line. What's wrong? Proper believes they must be doing something that's making a guilty party nervous. That means we're doing it right. But instead of backing off, Proper and FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick step up their investigation. We decided we're taking the fifth. They bring in Enrique Ayala who says he and his two friends will take the fifth in front of the grand jury and refuse to answer any questions. Investigators must continue to search for some way to crack open the case and get someone to talk. Gentlemen. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. This thing is dragged on now, nothing happened, but it's not coming to a hit. How the hell do we get on track? A month later in New York, the Secret Service calls in FBI Special Agent Larry Wack. They've arrested a counterfeiter who specializes in making fake IDs who wants to cut a deal. 
He claims to know of a plot by the Ayala brothers to kill the U.S. Attorney General and Prosecutor Eugene Proper. After months of investigation, this could be the break in the case the FBI has been waiting for. The break that will finally lead them to the bombers. In Washington, D.C., a remote control bomb kills a former left-wing Chilean ambassador and his assistant. In New York, eight months after the assassination, a counterfeiter contacts the FBI. He provides fake IDs to an anti-communist Cuban group suspected of the bombing. The counterfeiter claims to have inside information and wants to cut a deal with FBI Special Agent Larry Wack. He laid out a, a situation that he was in the process of making up false driver's licenses and passports and whatnot for some of the guys in the nationalist movement. You know, your first assumption is, is this, this crowd's getting ready to take off. They're going underground. The counterfeiter says the Cuban nationalists told him that if their leader, Enrique Ayala, goes to jail, they will kill the U.S. Attorney General and Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper, the prosecutor on the case. Agent Wack offers to speak to the Secret Service on the counterfeiter's behalf if he will inform on Enrique Ayala and his brother Sanchez. And you're willing to follow through on this? The counterfeiter reluctantly agrees. He says he's supposed to meet with Sanchez Ayala soon to deliver a false ID. The night of the meeting, Agent Wack watches from hiding. The counterfeiter arrives carrying a false ID hidden in a magazine. We were able to corroborate a lot of what he was telling us without him knowing it. When they see Ayala exit the restaurant with the same magazine, the FBI knows that their new informant told the truth about working with the Ayalas. Maybe the Ayalas can lead them to their Chilean contact. Proper again calls Enrique Ayala into court, but he fails to appear. FBI agents can't find him anywhere. He's become a fugitive. This only adds to investigators' belief that he played a role in Letelier's assassination. Two and a half weeks later, the investigator's inside man delivers more fake IDs to Sanchez Ayala. At the end of the meeting, Sanchez rips a dollar in two and gives the counterfeiter half. Sanchez says that a tall, blonde Chilean may contact the counterfeiter with the other half of the bill. You know, this was turning into a James Bond uh, spy novel here with a half a dollar bills and everything, the way this thing was going. But there was that tall, blonde Chilean again that we already heard about surfacing. He was this continuous, elusive guy. The FBI doubts this mysterious Chilean intelligence agent will come all the way to America again to meet with their counterfeiter. Chilean intelligence can fabricate their own high-quality fake IDs. Agents follow Sanchez Ayala to Miami, hoping he will lead them to his fugitive brother. But after days of trailing Sanchez, they lose him. Two weeks later, the FBI gets an unlikely break when a tall, blonde Chilean approaches the counterfeiter. At first, the Chilean casually chats with him about motorcycles. But before he leaves, he says that a friend of Enrique Ayala's will be in touch for more false IDs. When he hears about the tall, blonde Chilean, Agent Wack arranges an urgent meeting with the counterfeiter. Agent Wack shows the counterfeiter a photo layout, including a passport photo of a Chilean intelligence agent who tried to get into the U.S. using the false name Juan Williams. Showed him the pictures, and he goes right to the Williams photo, and he says, this is the guy that I met, absolutely no question about it. Investigators finally have a name to link to the mysterious stranger. 
They go to Chile to try and learn all they can about the man who calls himself Juan Williams. In Santiago, FBI Special Agent Bob Shearer discovers that no one named Juan Williams works for the government or the armed forces. Washington, D.C. It has been one year since the assassination of former left-wing Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his assistant Ronnie Moffat. Investigators believe the right-wing anti-Castro Cubans working with people inside Chile's intelligence agency possibly orchestrated the murder. Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper tries to make sense of the lead so far. The case started to slow down in, the, in mid to late 1977 because when we had this information, we didn't really have a whole lot of proof. And we were trying to get information from Chile without a lot of success. Investigators decide to approach the Chilean government directly and demand information on the intelligence agent who is meeting with Cuban bomb makers in the U.S. and uses the false name Juan Williams. Chile's got what appears to be a bona fide intelligence agent running around with a bunch of bombers in the United States, and this is going to be very embarrassing for Chile. They better have a good answer for this one. In Santiago, Chile, what is it that I can do for you today? Agent Shearer tells a Chilean official that the FBI wants to interview Juan Williams and another intelligence agent who also applied for a U.S. visa using a false name. You're quite sure. We have some photos of them. The U.S. could prosecute both men for filing for a visa with a fake passport. The Chileans say they will look into it. We have a very large organization. After waiting a month with no reply from Chile, Proper files court papers with an unsealed cover letter that includes the agent's false names and implies they played a major role in Letelier's murder. If the Chilean government masterminded the killing, Proper intends to hold them accountable. I summarized what I thought the evidence would show and put it in a letter that was outside the package. Nobody had ever seen that done before, and the State Department sort of laughed about it. But I thought when, when that became public, and I made sure it became public because it was not a sealed document, the Chileans would panic and we'd start to hear things. Then what happened is the photographs which were in their sealed leaked to the press. News stories hit front pages all over the world, accusing the Chilean intelligence service called DINA of the killing. And the Chileans went crazy because all of a sudden it was saying DINA was involved with the Cubans in killing Letelier. Didn't say 100%. And the Chileans started calling us. They wanted a meeting with the Secretary of State. They wanted a meeting with the Attorney General. The newspaper articles unleash a flood of tips for the FBI. One newspaper identifies the mysterious blonde intelligence agent known as Juan Williams. In a shocking twist, it reveals that he was born in the US. The FBI is stunned. Could it be possible that the Chilean assassin is an American? While the FBI investigates the 1976 car bomb killing of Orlando Letelier and his aide Ronnie Moffat, newspapers all over the world pick up the story of two Chilean intelligence officers suspected of the killings. When the story breaks, the FBI gets word that a newspaper has identified the intelligence agent known as Juan Williams. It appears he's an American. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. When it turned out one of them was a U.S. national, that made our position so much stronger. And why was a U.S. national working for the Chilean intelligence service? The U.S. passport office reports that there is a Michael Townley who matches the description of the blonde intelligence agent currently registered as an American living in Chile. He's 36, born in Iowa, but grew up in Chile. Agents head to Fort Lauderdale to follow up another tip that Juan Williams is really a man named Kenneth Einart. He's been buying electronic surveillance equipment for the Chilean government at an electronics store that sells hidden microphones, phone taps, and other high-tech surveillance equipment. 
the store owner identifies the Juan Williams passport photo as Kenneth Einart. The owner provides records showing that Einart shopped at the store the day the bomb killed Letelier. He also provides an official letter from the Chilean government authorizing Kenneth Einart and Michael Townley to make purchases on their behalf. The FBI now believes that Kenneth Einart is an alias for Michael Townley and that the Chilean government is somehow involved in the killing. Now, the FBI has their first solid suspect in the case. The next day in New York, FBI Special Agent Larry Wack meets with a counterfeiter turned informant. He's been watching a group of anti-communist Cuban nationalists the FBI suspects of working with the government of Chile. Agent Wack wants to know how they are responding to the news that the FBI has identified their Chilean contact, Michael Townley. Everybody in the exile community with the nationalists and everywhere else went scrambling. It was like, uh-oh, cat's out of the bag. They know who he is. And it was time to run. Agent Wack pressures the counterfeiter to set up a meeting with a key Cuban nationalist suspect before he runs. I told the, uh, the counterfeiter, I said, just tell him flat out that I came to see you. I found out that you're hanging with the nationalists again and that I paid you a visit and you're getting subpoenaed to the grand jury. The plan works, and the counterfeiter meets with the suspect to ask his advice. They ask you to testify. You the suspect tells him to take the fifth and say nothing. The, fifth. the counterfeiter keeps asking why. Because we did it. We did it, meaning Letelier. We did it. We know it. They know it. Let them prove it, uh, which is exactly what we wanted. The FBI now has an informant's claim that a nationalist confessed. But they still need some physical evidence linking the Cubans with Michael Townley. We couldn't connect him to the murder. We had no evidence he was involved in the murder, but we certainly believed it because he was the blonde Chilean who was dealing with the Cuban nationalist movement that internally had said they're involved in the Letelier murder, and they were now fleeing. They were running from us. Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper and FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick try to fit together the evidence. You know, it's one thing to have a source who you may or may not trust 100% tell you one thing. It's another thing to have, you know, actual proof. Investigators desperately need someone to cooperate and confess to what happened. They hope it will be Michael Townley, but the agents have to find him first. The next step was to go to Chile and to try to, in some way, force the government of Chile to cooperate with us in the investigation. The fact that these two men had applied for false passports to come to the United States a week before the assassination was of real interest to us. Over the next two weeks, Proper and the U.S. government put tremendous pressure on Chile. Proper prepares official letters through the world court, requesting the chance to talk with Townley. I took him to the chief judge in Washington, and he signed the documents. He asked me how the case was going. I'll, I'll never forget this. He said, how's the case going? I said, it's a very tough case, judge. It's just very tough. He said, I know that. He said, but... God makes people who do things like this make mistakes. All you've got to do is find the mistakes. To find the mistakes, Proper has to get to Townley. But the prosecutor is still getting resistance from the Chilean government. I'm sorry. And the Chilean government said, you know, this is going to make the government fall. We can't give over an intelligence officer. We said he's an American. He committed a crime in the United States. We want him. We were not allowed access to people that we wanted to have access to, members of the Chilean intelligence service. But at the same time, uh, other Chilean officials were cooperating with us quietly. 
Behind the scenes, the Pinochet government quietly cuts a deal with the U.S. They will hand over Townley if the U.S. promises not to use his testimony against Chile. The U.S. agrees. The next day, Chilean police take Michael Townley for a drive. He hopes that the intelligence service will protect him, perhaps even reward him with a long vacation in a remote area. Just take me far and get out of here. He has no idea what is really waiting for him. On vacation, huh? Chilean intelligence agent and bombing suspect Michael Townley thinks he's about to embark on a vacation. Mm -hmm. But FBI agents are waiting at the airport for authorities to turn him over. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. There was an Air Ecuadoriano flight going from Chile to New York. And the plane was held by the Chilean government on the runway until we got there. Townley was turned over to us. He was disoriented. He was Afraid, he could not believe that the Chilean government had betrayed him. On the flight, Townley refuses to talk without a lawyer. Once in the U.S., the FBI holds Townley at the Marine base in Quantico, Virginia. They suspect him of murdering a Chilean diplomat and enlisting right-wing Cubans to help him. But the only real charge they have against him is using a fake passport. Townley meets with his attorney, while Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper prepares for plea negotiations. And it's going to be very difficult, because we really don't have a murder case against Townley. We still did not have any case against Michael Townley except the passport violation case. Miami, Florida. Hey man, hold up. That's Ayala. Hey, uh, Agents get a break when an alert Miami police officer spots one of the men linked to Townley in the murder, Cuban nationalist leader Enrique Ayala. You're Enrique Ayala, aren't you? No, sir. Please take off your sunglasses. This is my identification, sir. Say, what are you see? Agent Cornick and prosecutor proper use Ayala's arrest and the arrests of other nationalist suspects to pressure Townley. Enrique Ayala has been arrested. We went to Tanley and his lawyer and said, your time's about out. We've just rolled the Cubans up. We're going to make the deal with the first person who's willing to talk to us. We knew the Cubans would never talk, but we didn't tell that to Tanley and his lawyers. Tanley has to think we know what happened. We singled him out and brought him to the United States. He has to worry that we have more information than he knows about. But all we had on Michael Townley was a passport violation and knowledge that he had met with the Cubans. But unless the Cubans talked or Townley talked, we didn't have enough to bring a case against anybody. Don't worry, Michael. After hours of negotiation, Townley agrees to cooperate in exchange for a 10-year sentence. Townley reveals that he worked as a highly skilled agent and assassin for Chilean intelligence. He worked for the Chilean secret police, which was run by a general. And he viewed his assassinations as legitimate orders from his government. The Chilean secret police wanted Letelier dead because Letelier was viewed as a spokesman who was in the United States and creating a fuss against the Pinochet government. He was meeting on Congress with senators. He was talking around the world. And the Pinochet government was a very repressive right-wing government, and Letelier was very well-spoken, and he was causing them some grief. This was not Townley's first assassination. As an expert in electronics and bomb making, Townley helped commit assassinations in South America, North America, and Europe. This man, without question, was the most dangerous man I have ever met. This is a man who bragged about his role in building bombs that killed other people. And the justification? Letelier was a soldier. I was a soldier. Townley says he made a bomb in a motel room and attached it to Letelier's car at night. 
the Cubans were anxious to create ties to the right-wing Chilean government and agreed to help. Townley arranged for the Cubans to set the bomb off. He then flew to Florida, leaving two of the Cubans with a remote control. He says he doesn't know who pushed the button. The Cubans had no interest in Mr. Letelier. They wanted a relationship with the Chilean secret police for several reasons. Um, Chile could give them sanctuary when they were in trouble in the United States. Uh, they had a very similar political ideology, was very right-wing. Um, and they could get, they thought, material support, maybe money, from Dina. To prove Townley's story to a jury, the FBI buys an identical car and has him build an exact copy of the bomb. All of this was filmed by the FBI so that it could be used at trial actually to placing the bomb up underneath the car. All of the components were identical, the car was identical, and the question would, was, would the results be identical? We didn't know. Stand by for detonation. Three, two, one. When the dust cleared, I looked at the car that had just been blown up. It was the same car that I had seen two years ago in the crime scene. I could not believe it. I turned to look at Mike Townley. Mike Townley's face was ashen. He turned to me and said, I'd like to leave. I had two of the other agents take him back to the car. Townley was somebody who had been involved in several murders, but never close up. He, was, he always did it at a distance. He never saw the victim. He was a soldier. He was told to assassinate somebody. He put a bomb somewhere. He did something, but he didn't do it close up. And when he saw the effects of it, he was apparently very affected by it. Two and a half years after the Letelier assassination, the Ayala brothers and an associate go on trial. The photos of the two blown up cars provide the crowning piece of evidence. The resemblance was remarkable. At the end of seven weeks of trial, the jury, when it deliberated, asked for two pieces of evidence. One were the pictures of the cars. An hour later, they came back guilty on all counts. The court sentences Enrique and Sanchez Ayala in the murder plot. But in a retrial, their convictions are overturned on a technicality. Over the next 20 years, two other anti-Castro nationalists and three Chilean officials end up serving time for the Letelier killing. FBI agent Carter Cornick sees Letelier's murder as a tragic misunderstanding. I think he was assassinated for two reasons. One, for what he had done which was stopping government Dutch loans to Chile. And two, they perceived him as a threat, which in reality he was not. The Chilean military believed that Letelier was forming a government in exile in the United States. It was simply not valid, it was just paranoia. Documents uncovered after the fall of Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet would later confirm that the Chilean government ordered the death of Letelier. The FBI's relentless pursuit of the killers solved a difficult case and put rogue nations on notice. I think it sent a message to other governments considering extraterritorial sanctions, assassinations, think twice before you do it.